If you're anything like me, you've probably thought about the end of the world at least once in your life. And when it comes to these scenarios keeping me up at night, nothing does it quite like analog horror. If you're a returning viewer, you might be familiar with my series, How to Logically Survive, where I take series such as The Backroom to SCP and Analog Horror and take them into real life and figure out a logical way to survive them. For these videos, I had to do an insane amount of research into what these topics, such as analog horror, had to offer. And there were always a few entities that stuck out to me as being especially hard to survive and more disturbing than the rest. Ones that would bring a normally tame, low-ranking analog horror and turn it into a utter nightmare. For this video, these brutal and disturbing entities are exactly what I'm looking for. So I'm going to be sort of picking and choosing what I think to be the most dangerous analog horror entities based on their fear factor, abilities, and just overall how much damage and torment they bring to humanity as a whole. And putting together a list of nine entities I believe to be the most overpowered and just straight up unfair. Now stick around to the end to see the final rating as each entity is subject to lose its spot as the video progresses. When it comes to certain analog horror scenarios, I wouldn't blame you for taking safety in numbers, as in ones like Mandela Catalog, that would be the ideal way to deal with it. However, when it comes to the universe of the boiled one, something as innocent as watching TV with your family might turn out to be a brutal mistake. The boiled one, also known as Phenomenon or Fen228, is a demonic parasite that finds its way into hijacking local broadcast networks. Wherever there's a screen, there's an opening for infection with Fen228. This entity is designed to torment you, first with this disturbing appearance randomly appearing on your screen. Fen228 can appear on thousands of TVs at once and doesn't need to choose a single target. All it takes is being on the wrong channel at the wrong time and you will see him. Initial effects are as simple as being extremely unnerved by his disturbing appearance, but it doesn't stop there. If you paid any attention to what the demon speaks to you during the broadcast, if you can even understand it, the bold one exclaims, the very memory of my face will cause a manifestation of my being in the future. You'll be asleep in bed. I'll be there and watch over you. When you wake, you will not be able to move any part of you. When the doctors eventually find you, they will not see me, but you will. And I'll see you too. Forever. I'll see you. Paranoia is also a common early symptom of exposure to Fen228. Now, during this early stage, when you first see him, it is important to mentally prepare yourself for what is coming next, as you will begin to experience auditory and visual hallucinations as he stalks you around your house. However, these will be unique to only people who have seen the broadcast. No one else will experience the same hallucinations, so you'll feel crazy and completely alone. Well, that is except for Fen228. Fen228 can be anywhere from 7 to 15 feet, but it wouldn't be crazy to assume that he can manifest taller as he is all in your mind. You will hear trumpets echoing from what seems to be the sky, and Fen228 will watch you from around corners, through windows, and under your bed. For now, he will only watch you, but eventually, you will have to sleep. When you do, you will wake up paralyzed, and as you could assume, Fen228 will be there, as a sort of fucked up sleep paralysis demon. The only difference is, you will never exit this state. For the purpose of the video, we'll be looking into the destructive capabilities of Fen228, and they are massive. As since this state is permanent, the doctors and your family will never hear nor see Fen228, but he will torment you with demonic hymns and unimaginable horrors along with the sound of trumpets. Yet, no one will know the wiser. If you are lucky, you will die of dehydration in a few days. Now, this might sound dark, but if you think about it, that would be the easiest way out, as if people were to find you and think you're in some sort of coma as you're unable to tell them any different because you're paralyzed, you will be sent to a doctor and hooked up to a machine where you will live out 
God knows how long, being tormented by this thing. N228 is not stated to have any weaknesses, and since they're only able to be seen by someone who is paralyzed, basically invulnerable. Now, with the bold one being the first of our list, it by default slides in the first place. But can it stand up to our next entity? If you thought Fen 228 was bad, we were just getting started with our list. From the world of Gemini Home Entertainment, we see a Michigan summer camp be ground zero for the total invasion, or in this case, mutation, of Earth, by many disturbing forms of extraterrestrial beings. In a desperate attempt to figure out where all this was coming from, we launched a probe into space to discover a sadistic foreign planet known as the Iris. Now, the Iris is the first entity on our list to possess something I like to call entity projection, where the main creature on this list possesses the ability to make more extensions of itself often to exterminate humanity. The iris is one of the best examples of this. The goal of the iris is to mutate the planet that encounters. We see this happen in Neptune and begin to happen in the core of Earth. Wood crawlers are the main variant of entities that the iris projects, but harvesters and the wretch are also included in this. Now what this means is when facing the iris, do not expect to come into direct contact with it, as it sits at a safe distance all the way across the universe. Its wood crawlers, however, you will see all over the place, as they are the perfect hunter that can go not only in extreme places like, say, the desert or the snow, but you will also find wood crawlers in places such as the bottom of the Mariana Trench and even burrowing underground. So there's almost no place where you're safe. Most of the time, when they're hunting you, they are completely silent, so you will never see them coming until it's too late. The iris can also create fake people that call out to you and lure you to them, as well as a plant with a paralyzing agent and a gigantic mutated bear that will constantly absorb new humans into it. To show how dire this being truly is, we are going to look into two of the first people affected by this creature, and assumably two of the first to come in contact with the iris, known by Jack and Mary Dean. Unfortunately, during the Moonlight Acres Christmas party. Now, there is a few theories on how Mary ended up becoming part of the Wretch Abomination, but what we do know is she went outside for some air during the Christmas party and never returned. The Wretch would then attack the main cabin, and Jack would be the only survivor. And despite his intense motivation to solve the Iris's weakness, he would eventually be sent into a deep sleep and assumably infected with the Iris disease. Now, if you guys remember my original How to Logically Survive Analog Horror, you remember that I went over how to survive Gemini Home Entertainment, and there are various methods such as using fire or taking advantage of their thermal-like vision by hiding inside of metal objects like trucks and U-Hauls and behind hills and walls and houses. However, no matter all of this, like if you put all of this aside, it is without a doubt that the core of the earth is slowly being mutated by harvesters as well as the iris coming closer and closer. And once it reaches earth, there is no doubt all of humanity will be wiped out without a trace. So there isn't really much we can do here. The iris is here now laughing at us. So obviously the boiled one has no way of standing up to this world ending horror that is the iris, sending the iris to the number one spot and bumping the mental parasite down to number two. Kind of a running gag that a lot of the apocalypse scenarios in most movies always tend to start in America, but Monument Mythos takes that to the next level, being completely focused on conspiracies of the monument in America being used as a cover-up for many unfathomable and frankly overpowered entities, so it's perfect for this list. But there is one that stuck out to me more than all the rest, so we have to go look off the coast of San Francisco mainly Alcatraz Island. To the average person, Alcatraz was a maximum security prison being used for decades, which is why it became extremely odd to see the military gathered on the coast firing radiation at the island. Essentially, in the Monument Mythos universe, Alcatraz is not just an island, and it may not have ever been. Instead, Alcatraz's prison is used to cover up the fact that it has all the characteristics of a living cell, which, if you're familiar with biology, means it can self-replicate. And Alcatraz is no different, being able to replicate itself over and over and over again, absorbing everything around it, and creating what is called the Alcatraz Zone, in which everything inside becomes part 
of this one organism. The Alcatraz zone was created as a sort of prediction area for what Alcatraz would consume by a certain date. Inside the Alcatraz zone is assumably a disfigured abomination of flesh-like substance. The Alcatraz zone will inevitably be consumed and replaced with Alcatraz's cells. The Alcatraz zone for the longest time was predicted to be slow moving. So slow moving that it would take decades to even reach San Francisco itself. Now this wouldn't be as bad except for the researchers that predicted this zone were not able to predict the snowball effect that came with Alcatraz reaching the coast. As before anyone knew it, the Alcatraz zone had reached West Texas. And for those unfamiliar, that's halfway across the US. But even that isn't the biggest reason why I think Alcatraz is such an unfair analog horror entity. The worst part is the public is completely unaware as to what is happening and that they are, have been, or will be replaced as the government makes it a big deal to keep it completely covered up. So no one is any wiser. Which begs the question, would they even notice if they were completely replaced by Alcatraz? And to answer this question, we need to look into the Ship of Theseus. Which is, if you're unfamiliar, an old experiment that essentially tests whether an object is really the same object if it had all of its original pieces replaced over time with new ones. And this is exactly what we see Alcatraz doing. The prison over time has learned to mimic better and better until eventually it was just all of a sudden rumored to disappear. Most people thought it was over, but this was not the case. Alcatraz had instead evolved its replication ability to not only replace the Alcatraz zone with a near perfect match, but the entire world overnight. Now with this in mind, we are brought back to the ship of Theseus. If every cell in your body has been replaced with perfect matches of Alcatraz cells, are you really you anymore? And what could this mean now that the entire world has been replaced? No one could have done anything to survive as it happened so incredibly fast and no one even knew the wiser. But now they're all part of this prison. And honestly, who knows where it could lead. While Alcatraz isn't enough to dethrone the unstoppable iris, it is way less avoidable and widely spread than the bold one, and not to mention its speed and potential to now manipulate your body to its will as you are a part of it. Because of this, Alcatraz slides into the number two slot, bumping the bold one to the number three spot. Now, for our next entity, we're gonna start off by looking into the failed construction project of the local big corporate company, Simeodyne USA, whose goal is to give the average human the to manifest ghosts into reality from their minds, which sounds like a great idea. I bet nothing will go wrong. This project was taken on by the local construction company led by Paul Morelli, who gradually would go on to record updates to the team that hired him, and what they found was nearly unbelievable. Inside of the mountain, the first thing they discovered was a collapsed tunnel. But instead of giving him a chance to clear it, it just mysteriously cleared by an unknown force. Inside of the tunnel, artifacts determined by the team archaeologists that were shown to be extremely old, pre-Clovis in nature, which is basically predating Columbus. But despite this, ancient Egyptian, Indian, Roman, and many other artifacts from across the planet were found here. And there was no other explanation for this other than them being... <laughs> Now, the question I have is why? Why would all these ancient civilizations travel across the ocean just to make offerings to this mountain? What was lurking here and what were they worshiping? My best guess is the disturbing entity that was stalking Morelli's crew outside of Mount Greylock, known on the wiki as White Mask. White Mask is an entity that possesses inhuman capabilities, including multiple bioweapons that allow it to do stuff such as rotting their food and mutating its targets into abominations. It also has an amazing tracking capability, as it was shown to have followed Arnold Rivers, the archaeologist I mentioned earlier, home and end him long after he left the project at Mount Greylock. White Mask assumably has no specified weaknesses, and all of his abilities have not been confirmed. Still, it shows that basically anyone who comes into contact with White Mask or Mount Greylock as a whole is essentially sentenced to death, or worse, sharing the fate of Paul Morelli's mining crew, which essentially, if you haven't seen Greylock, starts out like an extreme form of a disease and then eventually will mutate your skin, organs, bones, and mind until you are put into a zombie-like state that is essentially under White Mask's complete control. The surrounding town of Greylock is wrecked havoc on, and the fact people from around the world came to make offerings to this thing leads me to believe that this isn't just unique to Mount Greylock. 
that this white mass can spread to the entire planet, and there is no telling what it could be capable of. Now, without a doubt, white mask is an incredibly dangerous creature that is capable of murdering mass populations. However, how does it scale up to the other creatures on our lineup? Because many of them have the capability of wiping out the whole human race in a small amount of time. And white mask doesn't seem to be that deadly nor does it seem to replace everything as fast as Alcatraz does. Which leaves the competition between the Boiled One and White Mask. Both of them are very similar, tormenting those who encounter it. But when comparing the fear factor between the two, along with the abilities, and how the fact that the Boiled One will paralyze you for god knows how long, and can be contracted from any screen on the planet, Fen228 keeps its spot at number 3, with White Mask sitting at number 4 for now. We are often led to believe what we see on news stations and on government EAS alerts, but it is painfully obvious if you watch any of the episodes that there is something horribly wrong with the news channel Local 58. Between misguiding GPSs to false broadcasts and disturbing kid shows with secret meanings, it is obvious there is something way more ominous in control here. And oddly enough, it's where you would least expect it. Our moon at some point in this universe became something different, something that caused a large-scale massacre and or mass manipulation of all the people who viewed it with the naked eye. Now, the whole channel is revolved around this local 58, so what does this have to do with the moon? Now, it isn't confirmed, but it is theorized the moon's manipulation ability has the people running local 58 under its control, which would make a lot of sense on why the channel's main purpose seems to be to get more people to go out and see the moon. This mass manipulation is referred to in the series as a lunar event, in which if the moon is then viewed with the naked eye, it will either cause a loss of one's mental capacity or an almost instant and painful death. And to this I ask, what makes some people who view this event simply get manipulated and the other half die? And we don't really get an answer to this, but in my opinion, again, death would be the preferable option. On top of this, the moon too has the basic form of entity projection, as we see some sort of alien-like creature on the episode Fastest Available Route. The moon, if looked closely, appears to be actually living itself, as horrific as the thought of that is. No one is truly safe from the effects of Local 58, as every program is designed to lead you into becoming manipulated or killed by the moon or just simply ending yourself. The damage that Local 58 has caused is hard to scale, but the potential is enormous, and in the end it just comes down to how many people will listen to what they see on TV. Now, while the iris and the moon are both planet-sized creatures, the moon comes nowhere close when it comes to the danger scale, nor does it on the fear factor. And I wouldn't really call it world ending. So our first two will stay safe in their top two slots, which makes it a hard battle between the third and fourth slot, as the moon would most definitely have more people view it and therefore fall under its influence than a TV or people who visit Mount Greylock. And on top of this, we have the Local 58 TV channel affecting even more people, which leads me to put the moon in our number three slot as of now. Our next entity is the first virus on our list, labeled the Medusa virus from the Stone Cold series. For those who aren't aware, the Medusa virus, when it first appeared, spread via eye contact with the infected individual, starting a multiple step process that starts with swelling of the eyes and ends with the horrible mutation of the body that includes your muscles basically melting and a horrible excruciating death. But the most horrifying part of the virus is how quickly it evolves. In this stage, the virus is, like I said, spread through eye contact. But the good news is, if you contract it and catch it early, this is the only stage of the virus that it can actually be stopped if you immediately remove the host's eyes. Now, as horrible as that sounds, the virus is going to make you blind anyway, so you might as well not die a horrible death. Early means of avoidance include avoiding eye contact with anyone just to be safe, and the military killing off infected individuals to stop them from spreading anything along with overall avoidance of other people in general. This starts the isolation. Stage two is when the virus, in my opinion, gets the most scary. Because before it was just like, don't make eye contact with anybody. And I didn't do that anyway, so, you know, win for me. But essentially, during stage two, the virus starts to become airborne. And it takes the form of a orange gaseous cloud. 
And this wouldn't be so bad except for in this form, it has a sort of intelligence, meaning the cloud will move towards victims and infect them like it was a living creature. And when you inhale this, there's a lot of extra things that happen. All you need to know is eventually it leads to what happens in stage one, followed by, of course, death. Avoidance in this stage include a majority of individuals locking themselves inside and employing advanced filtration systems supplied by the government. The outside world at this point became a sort of orange hue and everyone had to watch as people's wills slowly broke and were infected. Stage three is the most devastating stage. So to recap, we aren't allowed to be near people, we aren't allowed to look at people, and now we're trapped inside. So what could possibly be worse than this? Now let me tell you. Well, the answer is, apparently the virus infects crops as well and it just kills them. So now we have food shortages and it's even harder to get food. So you're inside your house, alone, starving. And to make matters worse, it infects birds, causing them to swarm outside and essentially make screeches at such a high frequency that you just can't take it anymore and you run outside in a panic and get infected. The only way of stopping it at this point would be to deafen yourself. So in short, we're beyond fucked. And every preventative measure only takes more and more of our freedoms away until we either succumb to the virus or die of starvation, deaf and isolated in our houses. The Medusa virus seems to spread to the entire world at an insane rate and kill a majority of the human race almost immediately, faster than anything else on our list. Even faster than Alcatraz or the Woodcrawlers as even they took years to spread across the world and assumably more years to fully mutate it, landing the Medusa virus at our number one spot on our list. Now, when it comes to the Mandela Catalog, it is extremely hard to predict what this reality is capable of. And this is especially when it comes to the false angel alternate Gabriel. Now, Gabriel is theorized throughout the fan base to be many different things, from the leader of the alternates to the Antichrist himself. Regardless, what we do know is Gabriel is considered a class 2 alternate and the only one of his kind. Gabriel, like all the other alternates, are deformed copies of real people or creatures. Some identically replicate them some have obvious alterations. In short, they are basically doppelgangers and the alternate Gabriel was theorized to not only masquerade as the angel Gabriel to the biblical characters depicted, he was also said to replace Jesus as the savior in this universe. So in a way, the alternates are demons straight from hell. Now, we see Gabriel and his alternates torturing the residents of Mandela County in many different ways. However, the most common way of this is through an affliction called MAD. Now, the exact parameters of MAD are unknown, but essentially, the alternates find out what really makes you afraid and what really disturbs you and tell you something that you would not want to hear. What that exactly is, is unknown. Basically, what happens is they appear, they show you something or tell you something, and it is so disturbing to you that you just check yourself out and it works 99.9% .9 of the time. Which is pretty disturbing if you ask me. Whatever makes you tick, there is a high chance an alternate will figure it out and they will exploit it in order to force you to do it since this is biblical, hell. Gabriel, apart from making alternates, possesses reality bending abilities along with plenty of others that I could go on and on about. So the only saving grace for Gabriel is the fact that he only, as of volume three, exists in Mandela County and the surrounding areas of Mandela County. However, there's no rules that say he could never spread it to the rest of the world, and that's a, undoubtedly his goal, causing the death of an unknown amount of humans as well as torturing them long after death. Ranking Gabriel would come to be a difficult task, but I think it's safe to say the alternates have not come to the widespread level that the Medusa virus has, nor are all the alternates as much of a threat as the woodcrawlers from Gemini Home Entertainment, and when it comes to replacing all of humanity with copies to do its bidding, the Alcatraz entity has Gabriel and the alternates beat in overall speed and efficiency, as Alcatraz seemed to flip the switch overnight and most people weren't even aware. Gabriel does seem to be more overpowered at manipulating electronics with his tulpas, and six in particular, putting Gabriel into our number four slot and bumping Local 58 to number five, Fen 228 to number six, and White Mass to number seven. Now, ask yourself this. When you go camping, what do you think the absolute worst thing you could see out there is? And follow-up question, when you're home by yourself, do you know exactly what is inside some of your furniture? Now, assumably, you answered normal to those weird-ass questions being, 
maybe a bear or something, and of course there's nothing in your furniture. But when it comes to our next entity, it aims to change our entire way of life as we know it. The Varum Carnus, otherwise known as the Singularity, is an orb-like creature of an unknown origin that appeared one day on Earth and is yet another of our entities with the ability to make extensions of itself. The first of which, the Harvester, is the reason for my first question earlier. It is essentially this bulb-like creature with tentacles under the ground that hides in dense forests and waits for big enough prey to set off its sensors, springing out like a bear trap, paralyzing them and killing them within minutes. There is no escape. The next form of Carnus, the Mimic, is even worse, as it is an intelligent humanoid creature designed to stalk and hunt humans at their most vulnerable. And the more successful it is with its hunts, the more and more durable and horrific it becomes, as it transforms into what it calls the Elder Mimic. The Carni also possesses many other species, including a titanic-sized creature with massive EMPs that disable electronics and vehicles, as well as a ton of tentacles capable of massive damage, and a rooted creature that lures humans to their death with spores, putting them entirely under their control. Now, although the Varum Carnus is considered a dangerous entity, as it has changed the way we would see life, a lot of the Carnies can be felled by heavy weaponry and don't really pose a threat to end humanity as a whole, like many of our other options do. So I put the Varum Carnus, supposed creator of all the Carnus species, at the number 8 spot. Now, while I don't really understand the entirety of the Monument Mythos series, it does contain another entity that I think deserves a place on this list. And the only reason I'm doing two for one series, as this creature is technically part of another universe inside the Monument Mythos series that was created when the first one blew up. It's a long story. All you need to know is this universe follows basically the same parameters of the other Monument Mythos, but it's technically a different timeline named by the creator of the series as the Nixonverse, which unlike the first one is extremely similar to our current one that we're living in right now. Unfortunately, it would not stay like this as during one of our explorations on the moon, we find something that is much different than in our usual timeline. Now do you understand why I called this series convoluted and hard to explain? Well, since I know you're just as confused as I am when I first saw this, essentially in this universe, Richard Nixon is just sitting on our moon, just chilling there, no oxygen, no nothing, just existing on our moon, apparently. And to me, this is more terrifying than it seems at first glance, because to me, it seems like this is another unfathomable being that is using the disguise of Nixon in order to sort of get a sense of security to the human race as it's a familiar face that we know, but God knows what this thing really is. And to me, it still throws up a ton of red flags. So because of this, I'll be referring to this being as the moon god from now on. And it has decided to turn Earth into its experiment, sending three powerful entities to Earth in order to see how we would react to godlike beings. Now, these were designed to help humanity, so they wouldn't be so bad until the existence of the Crescent King. The Crescent King has similar abilities to Fen 228 in the way that it requires humans to manifest it into reality. And once it does come into reality, the Crescent King went on to immediately manipulate and slowly destroy every language on Earth through its psychic abilities. No one had noticed the changes until they were too severe, and it would come to take ages for, the, for humanity to remember all the lost languages. Not that we have that much time anyways. As through various methods over time, humanity as a whole proved to the Moon God that they failed the test, and they would now be at the mercy of three superpowered beings all losing their minds because of it. Now, I don't think people quite realize how terrifying it would be as a civilian to be on the other end of a situation like this. None of these beings care about the environment that they're in, and they could easily wipe out the planet, which is basically what happens.
leading the Crescent King to become something even more terrifying as he is stricken with grief for what has happened and he goes on to assumably destroy the entire universe. Now, when ranking the Moon God, it's hard not to put him at the top of the list, but with his fear factor and overall lack of suffering, it makes me think that this might not be the case. When it comes to Stone Cold, all of humanity is wiped out, but it comes with the immense level of fear and suffering when it happens. The same would go for the Iris. But I would arguably put the Moon God above Alcatraz as since they are from the same series, it is easy to compare their effect and how unfair they are. So I think the Moon God deserves the number three spot on our list. Overall, when you get deeper and deeper into this list, it becomes harder to decipher which is the most unfair and in accordance to as a majority of them do wipe out humanity at insane rates. At that point, I have to look into the other factors in order to decide which of these entities is the most unfair. So our top three finalists in the video would be the Moon God at number three, Iris at number two, and at our number one spot, we have the Medusa virus. So I hope you all enjoyed the first episode of this new series. I'd be happy to continue it. If you made it this far into the video, consider subscribing for more horror content. Well, that was quite an adventure. I'm sad to see you go. But don't worry, this doesn't have to be the last time we see each other. I got another cool video. Just for you. Hurry, the video's almost over.